All right, guys. Good morning, everyone. I know. I know. It's really early. Yesterday, when they told me that this was the early chapel, I actually got kind of sad. Because I don't know if there's, like, a weight room above my room. But, like, it never stops pounding. Um, is there a weight room above my room? Like, can somebody tell me? That's what it is. I thought you guys were wrestling. Um, which is fine. It brings me back to my college days, which like not too long ago um but I, I don't mind it at all i have uh two twin beds in my room and i'm kind of tall and i don't fit on the twin beds so i have squeezed them together and i lay diagonally across the beds and it's it's great it's awesome i love it um we're here with the seminary like he said um my dad Stephen davies the president of shepherds i graduated from shepherds with my master's if any of you are interested at all in further education in Bible theology, biblical counseling, anything like that, we would love to take you out to dinner tonight at 5 p.m. If you're not interested, do not come and get a free dinner, okay? <laughs> but if you are interested, we would love to talk to you. Girls as well. Um, we have MDivs for girls. We have Masters for girls, women, ladies, whatever. Um, so we'd love to get to know you guys and tell you about what we have going on. That's all I'm going to say about that. Um, not too long ago, I came across an article on the internet, one of those random things I found on Facebook, about the top ten weirdest museums in the world. And there's like pictures, there's all kinds of stuff. I thought I'd share a couple of them with you because I think they're pretty funny. Well, two of them are really funny. The first one is the Museum of Toilets. And it is in New Delhi, India. So, if you guys, if you guys like toilets, uh, if you're fascinated by the John, um, then you can go to this museum. This guy's showing us how it uh, how it works. Um, <laughs> this guy's showing us how to sit on the throne. Um, hopefully, it's not an interactive museum. Um, he's just trying it out, I guess. Uh, but yeah, if you're interested in, in toilets, go to New Delhi, India. Check out that museum. It's gonna be awesome. Also. <laughs> This one was really funny to me. It's in Boston, Massachusetts. It is the Museum of Bad Art. And their slogan is that this art is too bad to be ignored. And so they collect art from all over the world that's just awful. Something that I would paint or you would paint. And they display it. Like, this is someone's mom, obviously. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you can see that. But that's like, that's like Sound of Music, fast forward 50 years in the field there. Um, and then this, Justin Bieber. Um, like, please notice he's eating pancakes, okay? And, and notice the size of his forearms. And it's just, it's, it's beautiful. His hand is bigger than his head. It's, it's awesome. Anyways, that, that was pretty funny. Then the, the last one I want to share with you is, it's kind of humorous, but it's a little bit sad. It's... It's actually called the Museum of Broken Relationships. And, yeah, I know, it's sad. It's crazy. Um, thousands of people from all over the world send in artifacts from their, their failed romances. And they send a story with these artifacts explaining their, their tragic, failed love affair. Um, they have all kinds of stuff from, like, guitars, um, the clothing, um, you can see there's like a boat there, um, it's pretty significant. I don't know if you can see in the back, there is, there's an axe hanging on the wall. Um, the story behind this axe is that this guy um, was dumped, okay, in England, and his, his lover um, went on a two-day, two-week, not two-day, went on a two-week holiday after breaking up with and he decided that he was going to get this axe. And for every day that she was gone on holiday, he was going to destroy a piece of her furniture. And so when she came back, she had two dozen pile not two dozen, I'm terrible at math, guys. This is why I'm a preacher. She had 14, 14 piles of wood that used to be her furniture. He said that it was therapeutic for him. And I'm just like, this is why she broke up with you, man. Like, you're, you're, you're a psycho. Like, you thought you had a chance of getting back together. It's, it's done. It's gone. Uh, anyways, you, you can turn that off. I'm going to stare at an axe the rest of the time I'm talking. But 
I, I saw that museum and, and I laughed like you guys laughed. I thought, man, this is crazy stuff. I can't believe people would do that. But it also made me sad. It, it reminded me that even though we long for love, I mean, every single one of us wants community. We want relationships. We want that significant other um, to make us, uh, I guess, feel fulfilled or completed. We want companionship. It just reminded me that our relationships are broken in this world. I mean, there's a lot of sorrow and pain and, um, and sadness that comes with our relationships. And it's not just romantic relationships either, is it? Our best friends stab each other in the back. Uh, parents neglect children. Children rebel and war against parents. You know, you could take your neighbor to court because they their bush is like a little bit on your side of the, the property line and, and you just get angry over stupid stuff like that. There's brokenness and, and bitterness literally everywhere we look. You don't have to see a museum to be reminded of that. The thing that strikes me, though, is that in the midst of all of this brokenness that we see everywhere we look, even in our own relationships, that um, God has called us as believers to be unified, to have peace, to love each other, to have this kind of fellowship where we can't be broken. So in the midst of all of this anger and bitterness and brokenness, the church is supposed to be this beacon of peace and unity. And when the world looks at the church and it sees unity, it's supposed to see something supernatural that doesn't exist anywhere else. And so then they're like, why, why does that exist? And then we are able to point them to God. That's the purpose of the church. And we know this is true because Paul pleads with church after church, you know, if you look in the, in the New Testament, over and over and over again, you see him pleading for unity. In fact, here a couple, Romans 12, 6, he says, live in harmony with one another. Romans 14, pursue what leads to peace and mutual upbuilding. To the church in Corinth, there's tons of uh, dissension, disagreement. He says, agree with one another. Be perfectly united in mind and thought. Then he says in that, a second letter to that same church. Finally, brothers, listen to my appeal. Be of one mind. Live in peace, and the God of peace will be with you. You can go to Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Peter. You see this theme. If you study the New Testament, what jumps out of you like and just hits you like a ton of bricks is that we are supposed to live in unity, in peace, and harmony, and love. That is what we are called to do. You also get the idea when you read the New Testament that most of the churches that Paul and Peter were writing to were, were doing a terrible job of this. Um, that's why every single letter is like, hey guys, stop arguing. Hey guys, get along. I mean, do you remember what I said last time when I wrote you? Please, I beg you above everything else, just, just live in unity. Stop bickering all the time. They need a constant reminder. So the New Testament is, is chock full of reminders to be pursuing it. Um, with everything you've got to make every effort to live in unity and peace. Now, think about it, guys. If churches 2,000 years ago under apostolic eldership were struggling to live in unity, were struggling to live in this peace that Christ had bought for them on the cross, it makes sense that we would still be struggling with it today, right? 2,000 years later, removed from all of that. We don't have Peter as a pastor. It would be pretty awesome. We don't have Paul as a pastor. If they were struggling with it then, of course we're going to be struggling with it now. And if we're really honest with ourselves, we look at our churches today, um, rather than being known for our love and our peace and our harmony, I think we're known for our schisms and our drama and our division and our church splits and our disagreements. So, in my city, we're in the Bible Belt, Cary, North Carolina. It's a suburb of Raleigh, so you have Raleigh, Durham carry, we're all together. Churches are popping up all the time, and there's this mentality like, wow, the church is growing, the church is doing great, but the problem is that this church that popped up over here is full of dozens of Christians who are really ticked off at this church over here, and they're so ticked off that they can't stand the thought of worshiping with them, let alone like having to interact with them and talk with them, so they just started another church. So we've got tons of churches in Cary. I mean, on the church that Colonial, I mean, I was on the street. That colonial is on there are 15 evangelical churches. That's nuts. That's crazy. You look at the church today, we're known for our schisms. 
rather than being a beacon of unity and peace in a world that is weary from conflict and heartbreak. The church has become nothing more than another museum of broken relationships. We look just like everyone else. And, and I want to ask the question, is this really what God intended for us today as his children? The answer is no. So the big question is, how do we live in the unity that Christ bought for us and called us to walk in? How do we live in the unity that Christ bought for us on the cross and has called us to live out. I'm convinced that if we want to live in that kind of unity and peace and harmony that Christ achieved and attained for us, we have to look to God. And I know that sounds so cliche, like you grew up in Sunday school, like the answer to every question is Jesus, you know? How do we live in unity? Jesus. Um, you know, how do you go to heaven? Jesus. How do we live in unity? It sounds cliche, but it is true. We have to look to God. I love how A.W. Tozer put it in his famous book, The Pursuit of God. Maybe you've read it. It's awesome. If you haven't read it, you need to read it. He said, has it ever occurred to you that 100 pianos all tuned to the same fork are automatically tuned to each other? They are of one accord by being tuned not to each other, but to another standard to which each one must individually bow. So, when 100 pianos are tuned to the same fork, it doesn't matter if they're listening to each other, they're going to sound exactly alike. Because there's an outside standard. So today when we talk about unity in our relationships in the church, it's absolutely vital that we turn our attention to God and let Him be that fork for us. Let Him be that outside standard that will align our hearts and our minds together. That's what I want to do today. We don't have a lot of time, so... Um, I want to briefly look at Ephesians 1. I know that you guys have been in Ephesians. Um, I hopefully won't go over a ton of stuff that you've already heard, but turn to Ephesians 1, and I want to look at that first section, 3 through 14, and I just want to read that first section. I want to show you two things about God that we see in Ephesians 1, and then I want to show you the implications that it has on our lives as we pursue unity in His church, okay? So, Ephesians 1, start in verse 3, and we'll go to verse 14. Follow along with me. This is the Word of God. I know you're tired, but try to lean into this, okay? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He has lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will, according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth, because in Him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. In Him you also, when you heard this word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. So the first thing I want to point out in this passage is that the Trinity is unified. And they're unified in the work of redemption. So the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit are, are all working together. They have different roles, but they're working together in harmony and perfect unity to redeem fallen mankind. One author uh, put it this way, human redemption is the combined activity of the Father, Son, and Spirit in that it is predicated on the love of God, whose love sets it in motion. It is affected historically through the death and resurrection of Christ the Son, and it is actualized in the life of believers through the power of the Holy Spirit. St. Augustine said it this way, From redemption predestined to redemption consummated, our salvation is encompassed by the triune God. 
There's unity in the Trinity in their work to redeem fallen mankind. So they're playing together. They're, they're working it out together. This is huge, guys, because for most of my life, I thought that there was like this, this scene in heaven where God the Father was looking down on, on weary, fallen mankind, and he was seeing all of these sinners almost like right before Noah. And he was like, man, look at all of this sin and, and how much they hate me and how much they're rebelling against me. And I thought that God the Father was just about to pour out his wrath on us. And then right at the right moment, just at the right moment, he's about to shower his wrath down on us. And Jesus comes flying into the courtroom and he's like, no, Father, don't do it. Send me instead. Let me take their wrath instead. And I kind of had this, this vision of this throne room of God is really just, really holy and really righteous and He's full of righteous wrath toward me. But Jesus, Jesus is my advocate. Jesus is my friend. And he kind of, he kind of appeases his wrathful father. That's what I thought was going on. You read something like Ephesians 1 and you realize that's not the case at all. That God's love is what caused Christ to come. They weren't opposed. It wasn't God saying, give them justice. And Jesus saying, no, give them grace. They were together in their plan, unified, one mind. It's huge. Without all three of them working, we don't have salvation. This is the point that I want to get to. The unity of the Trinity is on full display as each person works side by side with one heart, with one mind, with one common goal, one shared vision to redeem fallen humanity. They're unified in their constant work of saving sinners. The second thing I want you to see here is that there is a great purpose behind this action, behind all of their activity. Um, every single aspect of this triune work of redemption from start to finish is carried out for His glory. Look back at Ephesians 1 and see how Paul explains this. Look at verse 6. He says, in love, the Father predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of, will, of His will. And look at this phrase. To the praise of His glorious grace. So when the Father chose us before the foundations of the world were even laid, when redemption was predestined on our behalf, it was done so that He would get glory. To the praise of His glory. Look at verse 11. In Him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, so that we who were the first to hope in Jesus might be to the praise of His glory. See that phrase again? Same phrase. So when God gives us our inheritance through the death and resurrection of His Son, salvation of actualized, it is for His glory. The cross, the death, the resurrection is for His glory. Then look at verse 13. We were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of His glory. You see the same phrase again. So when the Spirit seals us and acts as our guarantee of this future inheritance of heaven, He does so that He will get glory. Again. So all three aspects in this process of our redemption, from redemption predestined to redemption applied to redemption consummated, every single aspect of it is for God and for His glory. Which means that the ultimate reason God saves sinners is not humanistic. While we benefit greatly from it, like, I have hope and joy and peace, satisfaction and a promise of an eternity with God. I benefit beyond imagination because of what He did for me. But that is not the ultimate purpose. The ultimate purpose is so that He will get glory. And how does He get glory? He gets glory when every tribe and every tongue and every nation of these peoples that He created bows and worship and, and says You are my Lord. You are my King. You are my Master. He's glorified. He saves sinners. He alone gets glory. So the main reason that God saves us is so that His name will be 
glorified to the praise of His glorious grace by bringing those who were once far off from Him at war with Him. Like, I don't know about you, but my salvation was much less like a rescue and much more like a kidnapping. Like, I did not want it, okay? I was 16. I was living my life, pursuing all of my desires and all of my dreams. It wasn't the rescue. I didn't want to be saved, okay? I hated my dad. I hated the church. I hated all things Christian. And he, he like, dragged me to him. And he saved me. He kidnapped me. Against my will, he saved me. That's my testimony. He's the only one that gets glory for that. And, and when he brings sinners who hate him, who, are, who want no part of him, and he, he pulls them to himself, and he says, no, you're my child, he gets the praise and the honor that is due him. That is his ultimate goal. So when we talk about the unity of the Trinity, we have to grasp that what binds them together at their foundation, at their core, is a shared passion and plan for their own glory. This is the point. This is what we got to get this morning. Their, their passion for their own glory manifests itself in the way they pursue and save the lost with one heart and one mind. See where I'm going with this, right? Two implications for us today. One. If unity in our triune God is built upon a shared vision and passion for His own glory, then unity in our relationships here in His church must be built on the same thing. I, I think one of the main reasons churches are known for schisms and uh, division rather than unity is that most of us think that we are the most important people in the world. Uh, like We kind of grow up thinking this about ourselves. I, I, I can remember my parents telling me, you are not the center of the universe. And I just kind of laugh, like pat them on the back, like, that's cute that you would say that. But we all know I'm the center of your universe. I mean, you cook for me. Um, you, you buy my clothes. You make me, you know, literally breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day. You do my laundry. You drive me everywhere I want to go. Of course the world revolves around me. Of course I'm the center of the universe. Honestly, I, I think we're born with this idea that we are really kings. And everyone else is kind of like our, our servant. I, I have a son. He's almost two. He's awesome. He's the cutest little boy in the, in the whole world. But man, he, he is a sinner. And he is too. Um, when he doesn't get his way, he goes nuts. I mean, he goes crazy. He, he went through this phase we finally got him out of this phase. But, like, if we told him that he couldn't have, like, ice cream before lunch or whatever, he, he'd literally fall to his knees and he would start banging his head on the ground, whether it was wood or concrete or carpet. It didn't matter to him. He's like, this will show him. <laughs> this this will teach them to not give me ice cream. I'm going to give myself a concussion. Like, yeah, this is brilliant. Um, he, he gets angry. He yells runs around, cries. I didn't have to teach him to do any of that. Let me just tell you, I promise you, he hasn't seen me do any of that, okay? When I don't get what I want, I don't bang my head up against the pavement. Uh, that's that's ludus, lunacy. Uh, he gets it from his father, Adam. It's in his nature. We're, we're born lovers of self. We're born thinking that we're kings. All you have to do is hit up social media and you will find that... Uh, we just can't stop taking pictures of ourselves, can we? Um, we've even invented all of these hashtags that make us feel less guilty for it. So it's like if everyone's doing it, then I'm not a narcissist because everyone's doing it. It's like Selfie Sunday and My Face Monday and Tell Me I'm Pretty Tuesday and uh, Wow, I'm a Really Awesome Person Wednesday. And like Throwback Thursday is really just tell me I was cute when I was a child Thursday, please. Like, give me some sort of affirmation. Give me attention. Like, I'm desperate for somebody to tell me I look good. Or to give me a like or something. It's silly, but this is, I'm there. I struggle with the same thing. It just manifests itself in different ways. I don't take a picture of my face. I take a picture of my son, and I'm like, everyone tell me how cute my son is. You know? Like, we're all there. Shows up in different ways, right? We are fame addicts. 
We wake up every day with our flesh that wants nothing more than to bring us praise and to bring us honor and to bring us glory. And we get ticked off when we don't get what we think is ours. Why does division exist? It's because someone else's opinion or preference or desire be out our opinion or preference or desire. So we fight to win. We take this into our relationships in the church too. So we walk into church, we find people who look like us, we find people who dress like us, who talk like us because they make us feel comfortable. Their preferences are our preferences. We see a bunch of people our age, we feel a sense of camaraderie because we're all on the same Page, same stage of life, we can relate to them, they're just like us, and it feels so good. If a sermon is preached with a good amount of humor, passion, it makes sense, if the band is really tight, if the singers are on key, which is always a good thing, um, we feel really good, because we got what we came for, right? But, but if the music stinks, I know I'm standing there, and I'm mad, and I'm like, Why? Why, is, why do I have to sit through this? And then I, I go home and I'm like, Caroline, like, we, we got to do something about this. If I wasn't a pastor of this church, I would leave. Like, I would leave. It's that bad. I want to be in a church that has this kind of music. I want to be in a church that has this kind of atmosphere. I want to be, and I, I just kind of go through this list of all my preferences, you know? I get angry. I can't tell you how many times uh, unity has been fractured and squashed over something as insignificant as a musical genre. Um, much of the older generation is dead set in their preferences and we like to beat them up. But guess what? We are dead set in our preferences as well. Um, neither of us are really ready to, to, to budge on that, right? And so rather than the world looking into our churches and seeing like this really diverse, multi-generational body of like white hair and salty hair and blonde hair and like why are these young people with these middle-aged people with these old people, and why are they sitting together and worshiping together and singing hymns, and why why do they love each other? It, it must be supernatural. Rather than seeing that, they see this church on First Avenue that's a bunch of young people. They wear, they wear jeans, and they have a rock band. And they see this church on Fifth Avenue that everyone's wearing suits, and it's a bunch of old people because they have a piano and they sing hymns, and they don't see unity. It makes sense to them. They see a bunch of people obsessed with their own preferences and opinions and desires, and God is not glorified by that. The truth is, if we want our hearts and our minds to be bound together in the kind of love and unity God has called us to, we have to abandon superficial frivolity of our own preferences. It is stupid, guys. And I'm just being blunt with you because I am where you are. And even more like 10 years ago when I was sitting where you were, I was like hardcore. Like, give me my skinny jeans and my hardcore music and my hip-hop, and I want nothing to do with any of that other stuff. It's stupid, okay? We need to let go of our own ambitions and our own desires. We need to renounce the longings of our own for our own glory and our own praise so that we might gain a passion for the glory of our mighty King. The only one who's worthy of it. The one who redeemed us through His precious blood and who is currently sanctifying us through His Spirit. Let us gain a passion for that. Take ourselves off of the throne and put Him back in His rightful place. The only way to do that is to abandon our preferences. This is where unity in the church starts. Second, this is the implication that I want to finish with. If God's passion for His own glory manifests itself in His pursuit of the lost, then our passion for His glory must manifest itself in the same way. By carrying out, continuing, participating in His mission. We can't even begin to talk about unity in the Trinity without talking about their shared work in the economy of salvation. It, do, it doesn't happen. The Father loved the world so much that He gave His only begotten Son. The Son loved the world so much that He humbled Himself, took on flesh, the form of a servant, 
bore the cross so that we might be saved. The Spirit loves the world so much that He's even now drawing men to Himself, sealing them, sanctifying them for our inheritance. They're all working together. This is what God does. So it follows that we shouldn't even begin to try talking about unity in the church without talking about our participation in His mission. Relationships where men and women go to war together so that the gospel might advance into the darkness and souls might be saved through the power of the Holy Spirit are the only relationships that look like His. Please let that sink in. Because I know for most of my life I would say, man, I want, I want my relationships to, to honor God. I, I want my relationship with my wife, with, with my girlfriend to, to honor girlfriend was before the wife. Um, I want that relationship to 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 look like to look like something that would honor God. And so we would like read our Bibles together. We would go to church together. Um, we would do the whole like let's hold hands and pray together. And I was just like rubbing her hair. I'm like this is awesome. Wait, what did you say? Oh yeah, yeah, amen, amen. Um, like yeah, that's 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 how we'll honor God. We'll do that stuff. And I'm not saying that stuff's bad, but if you want a relationship that looks like the triune relationship of our God. It's not just about sitting around and talking about Him. God doesn't do that. God is active in this world. He's on mission in this world. So, if you want your relationship to look like His, get out there! Start doing it! You guys are dating right now? That's awesome. You're about to get married right now? That's awesome. Do it together! What has God gifted you with? What are your talents? What are your hobbies? How can you uniquely enter into the darkness of our world for the sake of the gospel? Um, the relationships that look like God's are relationships that are passionate about His mission to seek and save the lost. Unity is, is fractured when we forget our purpose. And I'm about to close. Unity is fractured when we forget the mission that God has put us on earth carry out. One man by the name of Broughton Knox served as the chaplain for the British Navy on a ship headed for the beach of Normandy on D-Day. He was amazed at the fact that no one on board uh, cared about his own interests, didn't care about his own desires, no one was bickering over food, no one was fighting over clothing or, or blankets, possessions, there were, there were no fights. They were, they were a band of brothers bound together by their mission. But after the invasion, he writes in his journal that after the invasion was over and the war eventually ended, something changed on their ship. Everyone was still friendly with each other. Everyone still got along. They were still pals. And they just gone through Normandy together. Obviously, there's going to be a bond there, but something had changed. And several of the, the sailors asked this young chap of why things were different. And he would tell them over and over and over again that the answer was very simple. And these are his words. During those months that preceded D-Day, our thoughts had a minimum self-centeredness in them. We gave ourselves to our shared activity and objective. Once the undertaking was over, we reverted to our own purposes and our own plans and our own passions as people normally do. I think that when we look at our churches, and let's be honest, we see a lot of friendly people, right? We, we see a lot of, like, polite hellos and how are yous, I'm fine, thank you, let me just get to my seat, stop trying to talk to me. Um, but it's a lot of polite uh, platitudes, really. But if we want something deeper than that, um, if we want something more significant and more lasting, something that the world would look at and say, that is supernatural what's going on. We have to lay aside our own purposes. We have to lay aside our own passions and our own plans and zealously give our lives to the purpose that God has given us. And what is that purpose? Well, you find it right before his ascension. He says, go make disciples. You find it in 2 Corinthians where he says, you are my mouthpiece. You are literally God's speaking peace to the lost, right? That's crazy. We are the mouthpieces of God. That is our purpose on this earth. There are a lot of great missions out there. There are a lot of great um, purposes and 
charities and nonprofits that um, have great goals, but nothing is greater than God's mission to reconcile the lost to Himself. So when we move together and we work together and we sacrifice for each other with one common passion and one common purpose, guess what happens? Unity. It's the kind of unity that God wants for His church. So, let us place Him in His rightful place on the throne. Take ourselves off. And guys, it is a minute-by-minute battle. I mean, you think he's on the throne and all of a sudden someone cuts you off on the road and all of a sudden you're back up there, right? How dare someone interfere with your kingdom purposes? Minute by minute, put him on the throne. Worship him with the worship that he is due and follow in his footsteps of reconciliation so that he receives all the honor and glory and praise from our churches. That's all I've got for you. Thanks so much for letting us come. Paul's going to follow up tomorrow with some more practical insight. Um, I, I guess y'all are dismissed now. Yeah? Okay. Thanks so much, guys. Go and grace.